Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, if you're tuning in uh, live with us today, that's awesome. Welcome. And if you're watching later, that's great too. All this stuff should be available uh, still on Facebook and it will be uploaded to the A Athens for Everyone's YouTube channel. And at some point, the uh, DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, Athens chapter, will put it up on ours. So welcome to our talk about the budget today. We have a guest, um, artist and activist, uh, Athens local, Broderick Flanagan. Thanks for joining us, Broderick. Yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, and yeah. I want to consider myself quite an activist, more of a community organizer. Community organizer. Well, thank you. I'm glad to have the right, uh, the right adjective. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> uh, so. Broderick, I know you've been, I mean, you work on a lot of different projects around town. And so I know you're very familiar with uh, the budget process and how it's gone, especially over the past several years. You've been involved in trying to help shape it before. And you've also been very involved in the talks that we've been having with our other guests, um, with the Mayor Gertz and Commissioners Jesse Houle and Tim Denson. Um, and yeah, so, I miss I miss oh, you, didn't see this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had a lot of good feedback in all the talks. I'm like, Broderick's been there, He's <laughs> been there with all the good questions. Um, also, anybody who's watching, feel free to pop questions into the comments section uh, for Broderick as we go. Um, but uh, anyway, I want I want to start by talking about um, your priorities for this year's budget and and what you were hoping to see what you haven't seen and, and what you think maybe there's still time right to like change it and put more stuff on it or different things on there so what are you hoping to see put on there that isn't on there uh there's a lot actually and thanks for that question it's a great question um you know i'm hoping to see, whenever i look at the budget uh, i'm looking to, to see myself and my community reflected in the budget um, and so, you know, meaning the minority community, the black community, um, what are the areas in which uh, we are trying to resource those marginalized communities, communities that, that have been historically uh, left out and locked out and excluded from a lot of these processes uh, for whatever reason. And so when I look through the current budget and I haven't combed through the, the 400 page version, I went through the shorter version, the 33 page document um, looked at some of the highlights and listened to Kelly Gertz, uh, you know, short, you know, pitch and, and, and highlight video that he put out. Right. And so, you know, I, I haven't seen a lot of concrete, tangible um, ways in which we can bring equity to the community. And for one, I think there's, there's some confusion around what equity looks like, you know, amongst the mayor and commissioners, some of the commissioners. And so um, in thinking about equity and how to bring racial and economic equity to a budget, what does that actually look like in practice, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm hoping to see them take seriously a money's approach from the people's budget, you know, Athens, the people's budget, Athens. Mm -hmm. um, money Scott Blackwell, you know, has been advocating for the people's budget and participatory budgeting for three, at least three years that I know about. And so there were some rumblings and conversations going on behind the scenes uh, when the prosperity package stuff was going on. Right. Uh, of what that could potentially look like. Um, as I understand it, the city manager uh, was exploring a few things, but what's the result of the, that exploration? You know, um, you're looking at a couple of different models from other communities, um, yet where's the action items that come and follow that up? You know, where's the committee that's gonna explore that? Where's the, um, the move and the push to actually put substantial uh, support for that within the budget? You know, I'm not seeing some of those things reflected you know, people are speaking to wanting to see a great era of equity, you know, and, and speaking about Mayor Gertz on the first day he took office when he swore, was sworn in, one of the first things out of his mouth was, you know, Athens is going to see a great era of equity, uh, right. some, something to that effect. Right. Um, and, and I'm just not, I'm not seeing that in, in tangible ways. Uh, and I don't, I don't really want to speculate to what it is, but I have a few things, <laughs> a few, um, suspicions on, on why that is 
Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I want to see participatory budgeting. I want to see substantial, um, you know, things put in there to address labor, labor inequities and labor ex exploitation, um, mm -hmm. whether it be um, creating space for uh, companies, organizations to to better unionize. Um, and mm -hmm. how can the government support that work? Um, you know, they may not be able to control wages on a private market, but you can help support workers in their attempt to organize. Right. Um, you know, that's something I want to see reflected in the budget. Um, you know, I want to see, uh, you know, those measures that really create pathways for people to become, for poor and marginalized people to become uh, stable. You know, what is that? What could that look like? Um, right. That's one of the reasons why I wanted the community or the commissioners to engage with Dr. West Bellamy, because he was doing some of that equity work uh, from a, a local government position. And, you know, he created the equity package. He called it the equity package up in Charlottesville, Virginia. Right. And so by connecting those type of dots, I, I was under the impression that the local government, our mayor and commissioner and city manager would learn what equity could look like within a local government. But I haven't seen tangible, um, you know, tangible ways in which that is showing up in people's everyday lives, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. And saying like you feel like when West Bellamy was here, what that was like two years ago? Yeah, that was twenty nineteen, I wanna say, March of twenty nineteen, around the time when we were creating the prosperity package, right? Right. And, uh the prosperity package I think was a great idea, you know. Um I was definitely a proponent of that. Um I actually benefit from that in some ways because of uh, family connections submitting a proposal to create the neighborhood leader positions. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one of the neighborhood leaders, you know, that, that is funded by the local government. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad to see that that was put into place at the same time, you know, how do we empower that group of people to be able to inform policy in a way that creates um, more equity in our community that, that levels the playing field, especially for that labor piece. Right now, we're we're doing a lot of food distribution. We're we're getting people prepared for COVID, which is all great work. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing that that piece of the work, but how do we how do we put into the budget some of the things that neighborhood leaders are seeing on the ground every day when we're interfacing with families that are in these dire, uh, you know, emergency situations, and you know, like as we get ready to rebound from this pandemic and come up out of that. A lot of people are going to need uh, help becoming more economically stable, you know, right. get back into the workforce um, and, and, and paying their rent and, and, and a bunch of other things. And so, uh, yeah, I want, I want to see supports in, in the budget for, for that work, um, not just like with the food distribution piece um, or, or even the rent assistant piece, but some real true sustainable programs that can lead to viable uh, economic stability for families, for poor working families. Yeah. We got a question here from Jody Barnes um, asking about how you envision participatory budgeting. But right before you answer that one, Broderick, I was wondering if, since you brought it up, could you describe a bit of what the neighborhood leaders, like what you do, what your role is in case anybody doesn't know, like what y'all, you know, like the work y'all do. I know you do a bunch of different stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I can attempt to, to sum it up and, and each neighborhood leader, um, you know, we, we approach the work in a, in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and so essentially our job is to reach out to families um, in need and help resource those families, connect them to agencies or organizations that are going to help put them in a better situation. Um, yeah. I approach the work uh, by trying to connect people to labor job opportunities or creating space for people in some of these communities to be able to walk into those good jobs, good paying jobs, good careers that can put them on a different track or trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, but we also do food distributions. We help a lot of nonprofit community with that. We uh, help people sign up for benefits, including unemployment, um, food stamps and, and other um, resources. Um, we uh, facilitate community events to make people more aware of different programs and projects that are going on in the Athens community. Um, right. And so, you know, there, there are a lot of different things that we do in that nature and in that manner that help families and try to stabilize families. Cool. Thank you for describing that. And now um, we can 
get to Jody's question where she's she's asking how you envision the participatory budgeting, like what process might that look like? Um, that would honestly be a better question for a Money Scott Blackwell or, or Vanessa. Um, I am in support of the participatory budgeting process. And so when I've heard Imani speak to the process, um, it's really as, as simple as, you know, setting aside monies within the uh, local government budget for community members in certain neighborhoods to be able to have access to, to decide what they need for their community. And so um, I've seen uh, some of the videos that have been uh, implemented in other communities where they, through a democratic process, you know, they have an allotment of money for their neighborhood or community or whatever is defined in the particip participatory budgeting process. Mm -hmm. And they vote and on the different projects that community members that live in that area bring forward. And then they, they dwindle that down until they get to one or two projects that are fundable and feasible. And so yeah. the, community, the community has a stake in uh, seeing how, they, how their neighborhood or how it's addressed in, in certain ways or how work in the community is addressed. Um, and so I, I think that largely really depends on how much the local government puts into a fund like that for the community to be able to use mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. determine the type of impact that something like that will have. Um, if, if they put a little bit aside, then you're going to have a smaller impact. Um, if you put a greater amount to the side for people to be able to work with, they can tackle some 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 good great issues. I feel like uh, within the community, and, and so I'm people not... people have ideas. Though uh, I was going to say, um, so just speaking to it briefly, the, the importance of of validating people's ideas that have this lived experience, right? And I think that's one of the important things that participatory budgeting can bring uh, to that process of engaging people uh, and making sure that people feel like they have a uh, somewhat of an uh, autonomy or a say so in what happens in their community. Right. I've heard over and over again at different community meetings, different input sessions, people feel like their voice isn't being heard. People feel like they um, don't have adequate say in what happens in their community. And so how, how can we address that through the budget and, and through the local government in partnership? Right. And earlier you brought up um, jobs and equity and, and, and that can kind of, we can talk a little bit about a disparity study. So, so when we talked to Kelly on Saturday, he said that, that doing a disparity study is part of this new role that they're hiring somebody to do and that's part of their job. So it sounds like a disparity study is on the way, hopefully, right? For, um, <laughs> and and we hope in a timely manner. Um, and so, uh, disparity study. Do you do you want to speak to what that what that does? Like why why do they why do they have to do that? Or um, I know we wish they didn't have to. We wish we could just you know like listen to the listen to people and apply a solution. But well, they, well, that's what happens in some cases, right? And so right. I can't. It's, it's funny though, if you pay attention to local government enough, you'll see that when you when certain issues come up, they don't necessarily need to do a study. They just need to see another community doing it, right? And they'll borrow that model from another community without doing a study, just as long as another community has done, done it already and they have like a template or outline. And mm -hmm. so I've seen instances where our local government has taken a template or outline from another community and, and implemented or attempted to implement it here um when it comes to racialized equity though there has to be a greater degree of, of justification and i think a lot, yeah there has a lot of that has to do with the city attorney and their office uh trying to manage risk uh risk risk management right, right. And so they're so afraid of being sued for uh, the appearance of, of favoritism or whatever else you want to call it um, that needs to be a, a line item budget right there in itself. I mean, if you think about the civil rights movement, it, it was illegal for, for people of color, black people to be able to cast a vote, right? Uh, or mm -hmm. to go to school or, or, or to go to segregated spaces. And mm -hmm. so in order for those things to happen, like the laws were put in place, but in order for it to be enforced, you know, there, there were lawsuits that were filed, you know, and, and it had to be fought out in court. 
And so we're not going to get around justice, racial, or economic justice without taking those type of measures. So as a local government, I think uh, we should have a fund, some type of justice fund within the local uh, government because we get sued anyway. The local government gets sued. Like Tim Denson, I think, spoke to that um, during his session. They, they Since he's been in office, he said they've been sued a dozen times or more. Yeah, they get sued all the time. Something like that, you know. Yeah. And so the lawsuits, they're going to come regardless. And so if you're trying to manage uh, justice or equity uh, from that lens, fear of being sued, then we're never going to get there. Right. And so, exactly. Yeah. And so that's one point I want to iterate with that. Um, and, and, and to the direct question you were asking about, um, you know, I think sometimes people get shifty, right, from with public perception as well. Um, and so speaking about the mayor, city manager, whoever, like sometimes I think they put an extra layer of process in there just to kick the can down the road so they can have more time, more time to figure it out or more time or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be. But that's what it feels like. It feels like we're being stalled. You know, you have people going to the mayor commission every but budget cycle asking for certain equity initiatives, asking for things for minority contractors and, and vendors for years. Right. I've only been involved in local government paying attention to the budget side of things since 2015 or so. I've looked at about every budget since then. And, you know, I, I was just noticing patterns, you know, of how the Paul Kramers of our community are able to bend the rules and, and have an extra um, presentation after the SPLOS proposal uh, process has been shut down, they get to go in and present again to make a case for how many jobs they're going to bring to the community. And mind you, the jobs that they're bringing to the community are, was great, but are those going to be jobs at good wages? Right. You know, I went to one of the um, input sessions for the Classic Center Arena that's coming. And one of the things I was mentioning, because Paul came up to me and said during one of those uh, events, uh, what would it take for you to support this project, right? And I was like, well, you know, making sure that you pay the people who are working in the facility mm -hmm. a decent, fair wage where they're not struggling, where they're not in poverty. Yeah. And so I, when I asked that same question at the Classic Center Arena um, input session, the, the answer was very interesting. I mean, you know, Paul said there's a community benefits agreement and the developers and stuff have agreed to pay according to the MIT calculating calculation scale. And we know that that's still not an adequate enough wage. $11 right. an hour or $11 and some change it is not an adequate. Uh, I, the follow-up question I asked Paul was, could you yourself or any of the architects you have on this panel survive off of $11 an hour? And they had this blank stare on their face because they know that's not an adequate wage. And and so Paul comes up to me and tells me this story about how he started off as a dishwasher or someone working in the kitchen and worked his way up. Well, everybody's not a Paul Kramer. <laughs> Everybody don't have the opportunity to to climb that ladder in that manner and, and to make that type of type of leap. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> and so it is it, it's quite laughable for me. You know, no disrespect to Paul, but just the, 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 the thinking and the mentality, right? That, right. That when, when you try to address equity, that's the response that you get. And when you tell them that that's not enough or that's not adequate, um, then, then you know, you, you're looked at like you're asking for too much. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. But I, I was going to speak to a few more things, but I don't want to ramble on and on too much. But I understand, like, you have to pay taxes for an employee. You have to pay insurance for an employee. You have to pay benefits and all this other stuff. So it costs a lot of money to have a single employee. I get all of that. What I'm saying is if you can't adjust the budget enough to be able to account for that and, and still pay people a decent way, take home wage so they mm -hmm. can pay their rent so they don't have to be on food stamps, so they don't have to worry about you know what utility they're going to play, so they don't have to go to the blood bank every two weeks. Because I, I used to do that when I lived in Virginia, living in poverty. You know, barely making ends meet. My rent was only five fifty a month at the time, mm -hmm. but because of my pay schedule, pay cycle, you know, I was getting paid by week uh, every two weeks, and so I would have to go to the to the to donate blood just to have enough money to cover all of the utilities and everything. Like that, that's how we need to start reframing poverty. You know, because if we don't, um, we're gonna continue to see these persistent pro problems, and you know. Yeah, so I, I don't want to get too far off on a, on a tangent on my soapbox, 
No, but I, that, I, that's, that's, that's what we need to see reflected in the budget. How do we address that? How do we address families and people that are dealing with things like that? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I mean, what you're talking to is, is still related to the budget and the whole way that we think about, you know, everything in our society, our government, our structures of every kind. Like you're talking about like, like changing these narratives that we have already built in that like everybody can work their way up from being a dishwasher to being a boss like is every is it so everybody's going to be a boss <laughs> like right, exactly. is, or could we have a lot of workers who are all really well <laughs> taken care of um, exactly. it doesn't have to be the way they, they they put it out there the narrative that they put out right it's yeah. you know it's, it's gross sometimes but so we got onto this because of the disparity study and and we know that at least they're telling us, right? Like you were saying, another part of the process before they can start hiring what they would say, you know, like specifically hiring black contractors to do city work, right? They're supposed to do this disparities study. Do you want to talk a little more about that? Um, honestly, I don't know enough about it to go into too much detail. Um, yeah. I know that when people were advocating for revitalizing the minority business enterprise program, that was kind of the next step, I guess, that the mayor and city manager thought was necessary in order for us to go in that direction, right? A disparity right. study was needed to justify us including those, those special groups, right? On a federal level, you have those set aside programs. Um, where you have to include a certain number of minority businesses, whether it was women owned, uh, veteran owned, um, you know, 8A certified, and all these different special designations that are on the federal level that are uh, kind of, you know, put out there by the SBA, mm -hmm. um, the Small Business Administration. And so there are guidelines on a federal level when you're using federal dollars that you have to include those groups into that process. Um, I don't think they have anything at a, at the state level per se. They have a few set aside programs. I know they have one for GDOT mm -hmm. when they're doing like road and infrastructure improvement. When you use state funds for that, they created a, uh, a disadvantaged business program or DBE program. Right. Um, at, at the local level, we used to have a minority business enterprise program. And it wasn't an official like uh, piece of policy per se it was more of a resolution of, of stated goals and there was an actual program that actually matched that and so i believe they're getting ready to revamp that program and bring it back online okay. and, and hire somebody to monitor that and manage that and to recruit minority businesses to participate in that way which is all good at the same time when you only focus on the business side of things though you you fall into the trap of what happened under Reagan, Reaganomics, right? Mm -hmm. he, he promoted minority businesses. He's like, yeah, I'm a champion. This, I'm a, you know, and so that's good and all. And maybe a few black millionaires were created, but what does that do for the average black family living in the projects? Right. Not too much, right? And so we need both. And there's not a zero sum game. If we get business contractors hooked up. That doesn't mean we can't focus on labor too at the same time. Right. And so, yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I want to definitely make that distinction. You know, I'm not anti business. I have a business myself. I'm going in my, my seventh year of business, actually. And so, um, you know, it's important to support businesses in that way. But then also, you got to think about labor because not everybody's a business owner, even right. though everybody has a side hustle and, and you're starting to see more people file for businesses <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> And so, you know, I'm not going to say it's because of the PPP money, but, you know, uh, so everybody wants to be a business owner, but not everybody's going to be able to produce at that level to sustain their family, you know? Right. Um, you know, most people still have to work at the end of the day. And so yeah. how do we empower labor? Um, I hope the PRO Act passes. Yeah, yeah. And that will be on the federal level, right? That's the... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're, we're the DSA is pushing hard for it. If anyone's curious, uh, go to the DSA website. Um, you can go to Athens area DSA, uh, org and see where you can sign up to do phone banking around the country to help influence people to vote for the PRO Act. Uh, supposedly our two senators, um, Warnock and Ossoff, are going to vote for it. They're, they're a yay. Mm-hmm. 
hopefully that's true. Um, but anyway, yeah, the pro labor campaigns, we need more of them. Yes. And I, I want to see like uh, the worker center being supported in the budget as well. The worker yeah. center, green jobs pipeline, you know, all of that work needs to be supported in within the budget. Uh, right. So the worker center, you know, needs money to get started, the seed, seed capital. Um, so that we can start to recruit membership. If we become a dues paying organization, uh, we, we can become sustainable over the next three, two to three years, self-sustainable where we don't need, uh, you know, f funding from any outside source or entity. Yeah. Um, but to get it started, we would love to create a couple of positions where we can recruit people and let people know that the worker center is here in this community. Um, and then once we get that going, we do want to survey the workers so that they can determine what their needs are and what direction the worker center goes into. Um, how do we support workers? How do they want to be supported? Um, that, that is the work that we're wanting to engage in uh, this fall, actually. Uh, we want to be able to support workers. Right. Yeah, and the Economic Justice, Justice Coalition. Justice. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk. No, I was just going to uh, plug the Economic Justice Coalition. You know, that's the work that we've been engaging in within the Economic Justice Coalition, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ms. Linda Lloyd and Dr. Ray McNair, you know, they, they helped, well, Dr. Ray McNair started the organization in the early 2000s. And so it's, it's always had this economic justice focus and they kind of shifted. They used to do worker center activities around 2012, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And they kind of shifted away from that as they wanted to register more people to vote and to have more voter engagement and voter awareness and education campaigns on the voter rights. Yeah. And so we're still continuing to do that work, but we also kind of revamping the worker center model. And so we've been talking to worker centers all, all across the, the nation about best practices, about how to, how do we put together um, the infrastructure that's really going to support uh, workers in a substantial way. Yeah. And, and you were bold enough to ask the mayor right out and you said, are you, are you willing to put seed money in for that? And he said, yes. So we'll hold him to it. <laughs> right. But then you have commissioners like, like Tim Denson that, that want to say, oh, well, we can't do this because of this. We can't do this because of that. Well, let's figure out a way. Let's figure yeah. Out a way. Like, I don't want to hear we can't do because this, like, no, nah. like y'all don't tell Paul Kramer that. <laughs> Y'all figure out a way to, to make happen what he needs them to get, make happen. <laughs> it does. It does sound like literally when we do talk about the gratuities clause, right, which is the big one that always comes up because it's in the Georgia, um, it's Georgia law that, that prevents local governments from giving money directly to individuals or it. I'm I'm fuzzy on where it gets with organizations because it sounds like they can they can give money to nonprofits in order to do certain work. Um, I, as to exactly how that's defined, I'm not sure, but I do know that there's a line in there that says kind of like unless it's for like the the grander uh, public good, right? And it's like, well, man, that's broad, and I feel like you could really argue that like. I don't really know. I would like to hear more about why anyone would think that you couldn't argue that a workers center wouldn't somehow benefit the entire community. Um, yeah, it would yeah. because it wouldn't be for an exclusive group of people. Anybody that is experiencing whatever they're experiencing on the job, if they need feel like they need support, they can come to the workers center. That's available to every Athenian. Athenian that lives within our jurisdiction. And so, yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know what Tim was getting at when he was saying all of that. Maybe he didn't understand certain things or, or maybe I don't understand. I, I don't I don't know, but I would be willing to sit down and have the conversation so we can get, come to a common ground. Yeah. And figure it out. Like instead of just saying, oh, we can't do it because of this and leaving it there. Nah, that's not how that works. Yeah. Let's sit down and figure it out. Yeah, well, I hope we can we can start having those conversations, even though, you know, it feels a little like past due. But um, like when we talk about the worker center, I think I wasn't entirely sure. I still haven't talked to Tim afterwards, but like a few years ago, I know Athens for Everyone was talking about starting a worker center. 
And one of the questions was whether or not to have it be through the county. And so I was wondering if that's where he was coming from and his perspective when we started talking about it. And I possibly. was like, yeah, possibly. I remember him mentioning that, you know, when he was giving his talk. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely no. We don't want it housed within the local government. Like, right. This is a totally different. This is coming from the Economic Justice Coalition. Y'all already have like you're going to do it. It's, you know, you're not asking for the county to start it. You were just asking, like, okay, if you're going to be supportive of workers, how about you give us some money to help out with this? Right. I guess that got a little mixed for in his interpretation. but Maybe. I don't, I don't know. I would love to sit down and, and, and clear the air, though. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's very possible. Um, I will say, uh, you mentioned, like, you know, there's so many different things that need to happen. Uh, in order to, to really work on equity. Um, you mentioned rent, like people being able to need, need to be able to pay their rent. Mm -hmm. There's this program project reset. I don't know if you heard a whole lot about it, but I, I've, I've kind of brought it up every time. Yeah. 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 Now, I've heard a little bit about it. I haven't researched or looked it up. Um, yeah. Most of what I heard has been hearsay, you know, secondhand information. Um, you know, I heard Tim during his talk, um, when he was speaking to the program and, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say it's a, a bad program. I just, you know, it was interesting, like hearing Tim talk about how the government doesn't write proposals yet. <laughs> he as an elected official helped write a proposal for, for the rent assistance program, you know? And so like, mm -hmm. I think certain commissioners get to pick and choose what they want to invest in or, or prioritize. Um, I just wish they would prioritize, you know, equity in certain ways. Um, you know, like I said, the rent assistance program is a great program, I, I feel like. Uh, so I'm not going to sit here and say people don't need their rent paid. Um, I'm just more interested in trying to make sustainable solutions that employ people um, that help with economic development um, of, of stabilizing families. Right. You know, so that they have so that they don't have to rely on anybody to pay their rent in the future. Yeah. Like, when are we going to start putting a plan in place for that work? Um, because right. after we after we reset their rent, mm -hmm. they're still going to be in a vulnerable position, right? You know, and so um, as the world turns, right, as the community mm -hmm. starts to spring back to life and, and business as usual continues to happen, what's going to happen to those marginalized families um, right. who some of some may not even be able to return back to work because their position was phased out or something. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. And so after project reset happens, then what? Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I know there's, there's a lot of different moving pieces, right? And there's, there's a lot to the, to the budget. So I also haven't fully combed through everything. I wouldn't call myself an expert on it, but. <laughs> you know, yeah, me either. <laughs> I, just, I just have a lot of ideas and yeah like I, I feel like some of the ideas are valid some of the ideas may not be um I'm, I'm open to my ideas being challenged but i haven't seen too many people come up with ideas um that are of a similar scale or a similar focus that are going to help stabilize families in a certain mm -hmm. particular way mm -hmm. um and I'm, I'm just not really seeing that you know and uh, it's, I don't know. It, it confuses it confuses me a, a lot because yeah. people say one thing, right? And I'm talking about elected officials, community leaders, everybody. People will say one thing, um, and then you'll see like the total opposite happening when it comes down to the actual work that's being done or the action items. You know, I'm not asking the government to come and try to save everybody. That's that's right. not what we're asking. We're asking for you to enable you know people to be able to secure their own rights and freedom. Right. Just the way Paul Kramer is actually actually able to go to the government to get done what he needs to get done, we need people from our community to be able to do the same thing. Right, right. Because there's systems that allow Paul to do that kind of thing. What you're asking for, what the government should like provide, exactly. is the structure to do that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But we have um, the nail to get that done. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and um, it's yeah, it's ridiculous how how long that fight has to be. Um, and so we we hit upon the, the disparity study to help with jobs, and hopefully that's something that 
that gets moving towards um, hiring uh, minority businesses and, and things like that in order to do um, contract work with the county. Um, is there anything else that you were really like looking for on the budget, participatory budgeting you mentioned? Yes. Um, wanting to see that. And that was the one thing I think Kelly, of the list I had, that was the one thing I don't think is on Kelly's uh, proposed budget yet. Yeah, uh, and the, one of the other things that I want to see is adequate support for the auditor's office. Mm. Um, the, the auditor's office has been asking for certain resources. Um, I, I, I was able to watch a couple of the mayor and commission meetings uh, about a year or so ago uh, when Neesmith Smith was still with us on this side of life, you know, rest his soul. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was it was interesting dialogue though around what's going what was going on with the auditor's office, and you know the auditor is important. Like the auditor yeah. helps to maintain checks and balances um, to right. show us where our weaknesses are, you know, in performance in different departments. And so, without knowing where those weaknesses and blind spots are, you know, we are you know vulnerable as a local government. And so that's an important position I feel like. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have the resources to do what they need to do in that department, I have to ask why. I have to ask what's going on with that yeah. and why don't we want them doing that work to help strengthen us as a local government, as a unit, so that we can start to address some of these inequities that we're seeing, you know. And so I want to see uh, the support within the local budget, within our budgeting system, you know, for that office uh, to be able to do the work that they need to do. Right. Yeah, so more more money hopefully going to the auditor's office is something you'd like to see more of. Right, because, because SPLOS has never been audited. Uh, the city manager's office, as I understand it, hasn't been audited. And so, like, why? Why not? <laughs> you right. know, SPLOS it was first implemented in, what, 19, in the 1990s or something? And if it's never been audited in all that time, who knows what's going on, like, with, with those. Cause that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. If you think about all that Splash does and has done over these years, yeah, that's a lot, that's a lot of money to think about. Yeah. So, <laughs> could we include that part in the disparity study? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a question for Kelly Gertz. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can we, can we yes. a, a audit of Splash? into the budget for the disparity study piece because i'm sure you're going to find some stuff there like just about you know where contracts went and, and how money was you know used in those projects yeah yeah that's a good question um more money for the auditor's office participatory budgeting worker study, study worker center and all of these things, like really, honestly, everything within the local government needs to be looked at through an equity lens. Yeah. I say the same thing when I'm on serving on a nonprofit that I serve on. I had a recent conversation with the board of United Way, and I convinced them to like start looking at equity within. Because if we look at, if we all start asking other organizations to look at equity, then mm -hmm. we ourselves need to look at equity. Right. You know, but certain conditions had to be in place for that work to happen, right? Um, and, and being able to frame equity in a proper way and to understand what equity truly means, it's not mean, that does not mean that we're giving everybody the same thing. Right. That means that we're providing people with what they need in their specific situation. And if that's an economic situation, right, if that's an economic situation, if you're talking about poverty, giving everybody the same thing as you give like an upper middle class person, that's not equity. Right. And so fat free tw transit is not equity. Saving people seven dollars a day or thirty-five dollars a week, what are they gonna do with that? If they're going to a job that's gonna, you know, exploit their labor and pay them ten dollars an hour, of course that seven dollars is gonna be big to them. But that's because they 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 have a, a a suppressed wage, right? And we like to say like people don't deserve to make a certain amount because of their education attainment or because of the way they dress or where they live or where they're from. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's not a valid reason or excuse not that everybody shouldn't be able to make a decent wage and take care of their family. Right, exactly. Because the other side of that coin is people like looking into illegal or less than legal markets to be able to provide for themselves and their family. 
and we know where that gets us as a community and we know what people's solution is to that you know that whole policing system is built off of that and i was disheartened like a few years back when we spent 77 million dollars on a jail that's sent that's sitting like half empty now if not more pre-pandemic the jail was not even at 40 40 to 50 percent capacity so why do we have a 77 million dollar new jail renovation and and expansion the expansion piece i understand renovating the the the, the jail because of safety hazards yeah that part but they expanded the jail to house many many more people it's like they knew they were going to be locking people up it was like there was this design right yeah that's fascinating yeah so if you think about the grand scheme of our society mm -hmm. where we sit right now they do studies on the miseducation of children going through our school system right they, they have a study out there that says like if you're not reading on grade level by the third grade the chances increase that you'll end up in the justice system or injustice yeah. system as a, you know and so and that's how prisons and jails estimate how many beds they're going to need exactly it's so gross yeah and we we're forecasting stuff like that that like a fraction of that money could have went to the community for something like participatory budgeting for something like job creation mm -hmm. instead we're, we're putting money into things like the jail and i think mm -hmm. that was a splash project but still and there's like right. you know special circumstances with splash dollars just a little bit different from the general budget i get that i get all of that the yeah. same time that's a huge investment though in in the especially the expansion part they probably could have mm -hmm. renovated the, the 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 jail um for, for what a fraction of that right just to make it better for the folks who are there who are already there yeah not to try and make it bigger because you're about to fill it up with people exactly <laughs> I do, I wanted to, I remembered that I wanted to ask you something because um, in one of the talks on Saturday, you made mention um, that the diversity and inclusion office is very different than what was recommended, I think, um, mm -hmm. out of the, the committee. Were you, were you on that committee or were you just kind of around the... I was not. I was, I was going as a concerned citizen. Um, mm -hmm. as an advocate for the inclusion office um shout out to aadm for pushing the envelope to get that created it's definitely not what they originally uh, designed it to be or envisioned it to be or what we envisioned it to be the people that were advocating for that and so for that reason i was going to a lot of those committee meetings and this isn't a reflection of like crystal cabron or anything like you know i think she's a great person mm -hmm. and so this isn't a critique of her personally it's the just the setup of that office and the system in which like the, the checks and balances that operate around her position like is she really allowed to do what needs to be done in terms of bringing equity and inclusion and advocating for that in a specific type of way without mm -hmm. fear of backlash from her superiors or from whoever does she feel comfortable in that position to do the work that needs to be done otherwise she's just going to be managing poor black people and, and trying to be that liaison between the local government and and marginalized people who want to, to see substantial and tangible change in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so when I was at those community meetings or those committee meetings, there was a robust discussion around um, the difference between social inclusion and economic inclusion. There was a clear distinction between that because some of the people at the end of the meeting, I'm not going to call any names, but some of the people in the meeting were talking about, well, you know, we can promote this or promote that or invite to include people to this. And then somebody had to step up and say, well, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about inclusion. We're talking about economic inclusion, inclusion into these processes that, that stabilize families. And so is, is our current setup with the inclusion office going to be able to do that work? Um, I, I was looking for the original documents, the original recommendation mm -hmm. that the facilitator and the consultant put together for that committee. The original recommendation was strong. Yeah, I, I remember it distinctly. There were things on there like having the university pay, uh, you know, a certain uh, payment in lieu of taxes, I believe, mm -hmm. um, or certain supports to support certain funds, like an affordable housing fund. 
Um, they wanted the university and, and local school districts to be able to incorporate certain things into the curriculum that taught about black history or, or African-American culture and history. Um, and, and to change the narrative around like the current history that's being taught that's, that has a lack of equity and an understanding of, of the culture, black culture. Mm -hmm. And so, and then there were things about like just the economic pieces, you know, how do we include people um, in the contracting and the vendor process? Um, and so there was a ro robust dialogue around all those different things and that was reflected in the original recommendation that came out. But what happened was it got so dwindled and watered down um, to, to it was unrecognizable, I guess, from what they originally were presented with. And by the time it got to the American Commission, um, you know, it, it just, it, it looked different. Yeah. That's not the first time that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> nah, not at all. <laughs> Again, I, I say, whenever, whenever you try to bring race and equity into this conversation, whenever you're trying to bring justice, and secure rights for marginalized communities, whether it be black people, whether it be Latinx people. These, this is the, the, the type of like treatment that we get, the rhetoric that we get. And so there's a reason why people are running around frustrated, don't want to keep continue to engage with the local government, don't want to show up to meetings because they, they know it's BS. They know when they're being played with. Like people understand when people are, are being straightforward with them and they're trying to work together for solutions versus mm -hmm. passing the buck on to someone else um, and throwing their hands up saying, well, I don't know what we can do. Right, right. Or There's paying some... lip service to it and then taking away any amount of power that your suggestion actually had. Right. Exactly. I remember that happening with the, the anti-discrimination bill too. Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. so we, we need we need people in office that are gonna like take up these charges and that are gonna fight for equity and look at that equity lens without us having to even, you know, say anything. And I don't wanna like put it all on them, but they're in a position to be able to bring that type of change. And so you have people like myself and others that are speaking to these issues, that are trying to make headway in, in around these things. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's disheartening when you have a conversation with a commissioner and they tell you to go con try to convince Paul Kramer to get on board with your idea so that it can happen. Yeah, I had a commissioner tell me that. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put <laughs> which which commissioner it was. I'm 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 gonna spare them this time. <laughs> but you know <laughs> you know they, they attribute it to a learning curve, right? Yeah. But my, my justice claim or justice claim for black people for my community shouldn't have to go through Paul, Paul Kramer. Right. I should be able to talk to a commissioner and say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I think is a viable solution. Let's figure out how to make it happen. Instead, right. I'm told I need to go talk to Paul Kramer. Right. Paul Kramer must be the man in Athens. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to get on his level. Yeah, how do you get to that status? Mm -hmm. Well, I know you do. You do. You keep doing a lot of work. <laughs> um, thanks for continuing to push, even though this is these are the walls you you are being that are being thrown at you. Really, um, is there anything else that you you really wanted to speak to that that either through the the talks that we've been having or something you noticed on this budget or something that again that you really want to see that you're not seeing um yeah there's one more thing i really want to speak to and highlight um and why we need to act with a sense of the urgency right mm -hmm. like um I, I read somewhere or i saw some statistics that were put out about the um african-american and latinx people and their relation to wealth right? Wealth and, and non-depreciating assets. And it says something to the tune of that by the year 2053, I think it is, that Black people as a group will be sitting at a, a zero or negative wealth uh, accumulation. Like we're trending like downwards. And if I'm not mistaken, it was like CNN or, or some type of outlet that had written an article about that and so if if we take that to be true 
if we take that to be where the state of the black community is and where we're trending, we don't have time to do disparity studies that take two years. Right. Like we need to operate with, with a sense of urgency that matches the sense of urgency where we put in bike lanes or we do complete streets Athens. Because I was around going to the mayor commission meetings when complete streets groups were talking about bike lanes and about making streets safer. And now they have committees and departments within the government that are exploring those things for them to be able to work in partnership with the government to make that happen, right? Right. I was at the commission meetings at the same time and others were at the commission meetings at the same time advocating for economic and racial uh, justice. And you didn't see that same sense of urgency as with that trajectory and forming those committees to help support that work within the local government. You have to ask yourself, why is that? Why is there not a sense of urgency when you're trying to work with the government to address these issues that you see in marginalized communities that are specific to those communities? Right. Right. I, you know, I just remembered when you were, when you were talking, uh, I was like, oh yeah, the, the other, the other cool idea that Broderick brought to the table that, that I haven't heard about in a while, baby bonds. We talked about baby bonds for a while. Where, where did that go? <laughs> the city attorney, he said oh. he's bringing up the gratuities clause. And so he, you know, he, he effectively, I guess, put out, put out the, um, the interest that was behind that, you know, um, the city attorney is an important position, but uh, the city attorney needs to allow space for us to be able to take some of the stuff to court if we do get sued behind it. Right. Um, I said, that's where a lot of these things get hashed out. That's where new laws get created, right, or amended. Um, because just because a law is in the books doesn't mean it's a, a proper law or, you know, a law that needs to happen. Any um, unjust laws. Yeah, unjust laws, right. Um, I mean, laws are in place for a reason, but it was also illegal for my people to be able to drink from a certain water fountain at some point. And so just because the law is on the books doesn't make it, you know, <clears throat> that doesn't make it a just law. And, and, and so that's what happened to baby buns. You know, it was diffused in a way um, because of the gratuities clause. Um, and for those who are watching that don't know what baby buns are or we're speaking to uh, basically baby bonds was an initiative that i was trying to get us to implement here in athens that would invest in future generations of people that are living in and experiencing poverty and so children that were born into a household that was below a certain income level would receive and this is for the child they would receive basically a seed seed capital that they can use later in life Mm -hmm. um, to go to college, to start a business, or to put a down payment on a house. And so we looked at some of the demographics of Athens, looked at, um, you know, how we could do a program like this, um, you know, and what specifications we could put around the program to, um, to ensure that we we're reaching the target population. And we looked at, well, what if we do like public housing? So people have income requirements in public housing, right? And so they are living at or below the poverty level in most cases. Um, there are some people that live in public housing that work decent jobs, but their rent is adjusted based on where they work. And, you know, I think their rent can, can't be more than 30% of their income. And so if they have a decent job, making a decent wage, their rent is going to be a little bit higher. But, you know, looking at that structure or in those places, why can't we invest in those future generations to say that, when you become 18 or 20, um, there's this money set aside for you to develop some type of asset. Like I said, it could be pay for school, it could pay for a down payment on a home, or it could be for them to start a business, to buy equipment. So it's not like they're gonna get the money and be able to do whatever they want to with the money. That's not how the program was gonna work. Um, the program was gonna be for them to transfer that seed capital into some type of asset that's gonna help stabilize their family Mm -hmm. and hopefully grow their wealth earning potential over time. But again, like, uh, and that work came from Dr. Uh, Sandy Darity, William Darity and, and Derek Hamilton. 
Derek Hamilton is actually now part of the Biden administration. And I, I spoke to, to Derek Hamilton. I don't know his exact title with the uh, Biden administration. He does something. He's an economist, cool. basically, by trade. But he, uh, him and I spoke at length. Um, you know, the, his program has never been done anywhere in the country. And so he was advocating for it to be done on a federal level, uh, on a federal level where all children in the U.S. would get something, but it would be determined on your wealth, your wealth standing, right, of your family. So if your family... <laughs> If your family is wealthier, then your child will get less to start with. But if your family was in poverty, then your child will get 25000 or something like that to put in an account that will mature over time um, and that you can pour into over time. But it, was a, it, would be, it would have been a federally funded program. And I think in one of his talks on YouTube, he mentioned that a program like that would cost about 1% of the annual uh, U.S. Uh, budget which is a, a couple of, like $2 trillion, I think. Yeah. So in order in order for a program like that to be implemented, it, you know, it would be, it would cost that much, you know, at, at that at that scale and at that level. And I wasn't asking Athens to put in that much, of course. Right. But, uh, but that's where I got the idea from, right? Like, how do we do a pilot program to be able to try to do something like that here in this community? Yeah. But then, other logistical things came up, you know, like uh, how we manage the accounts, uh, where would they sit, you know, whose account would the name be in, and, and this and this and that. Sure. Uh, and so there were a lot of different moving parts to try to figure out. Um, at the same time, we were working with a group of dedicated individuals that were trying to figure out some of those things to write a proposal to be able to present to the local government. And so while we were in the process of working all those things out, uh, the city attorney comes in and starts talking about um, the gratuities clause. Right. And that was the first time I had heard about that. And I think this was what, back in 20... That was 2018 or... 2018 when we, I when feel we, like... started, when we were organizing around baby bonds. Yeah, it was 2018. Yeah. yeah. That's right. I, I totally forgot. You've like totally jogged my memory. That was that was the first time I had heard about the gratuities clause as well. Yeah. And then ever since then, the gratuities clause comes up as as a way to deter us from from doing justice work. Now we hear about it all the time. Yeah, Part of me really right. does. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, you good. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just, I'm wondering. You know, yeah, since that keeps coming up, and they're just, it seems like it just needs to be challenged, right? And it needs mm -hmm. to be challenged in the right way. And I wonder. There's got to be somebody out there, if not the ACLU, other cities or something that have fought for equity in legal terminology, right? We have these, I, I think what the lawyers are always trying to do, right? Or they're like, oh, we're going to get sued for discrimination. And it's like, but, but this isn't historically what discrimination has not been against white people. You can't, like, <laughs> like how do we legally define this differently? Right. People who have been historically oppressed, that is different. <laughs> like, um, and there's got to be people who are doing that work. Uh, I just feel like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough, right? I don't know enough legally if it's a good argument or not, but I feel like if you don't fight it, then it just continues to be said that it's a good enough argument. Right. Which is why I was advocating for the local government to start putting money in the budget for some type of justice fund uh, so that we can try to account for things like that. And yeah. I'm looking forward to getting officials, elected officials in office who want to push the envelope in that way. Right. Um, not blatantly set us up to get sued, but to, to try things that are going to be a benefit of the community. Uh, from an economic standpoint and from a justice standpoint, right? A racialized equity standpoint. Like, right. how, how do we get someone in office, um, or a few people in office that are about that life, that are about that work, that yeah. do that work in a real tangible way, that aren't afraid of that work, um, that have the community support to be able to carry that work through? Right. Um, I appreciate the Black Lives Matter resolution that was passed. I think a lot of this uh, can maybe come through some of that, uh, but but it needs to be more substantial and more you know, uh, more robust. Yeah. 
And another thing I want to see, I don't want to go on too much too, but I, okay. I want to see also in the budget some support for for Linen Town. Um, not not from a necessarily a reparational standpoint. Like I think reparations should be a federal level program. Mm. There needs to be redress though. The Linen Town residents are owed a specific amount from the local government and UGA. Mm -hmm. um and and that should be paid to them but because of the gratuities clause it, it, you can't pay, make the direct payment to the descendants of Lennon Town. Right. um but i want to see some adequate supports in there for Lennon Town and their initiatives um especially the this i think they want to do a, some type of center um yeah with, uh, some type of center on history or historic center like the justice uh, and memory center or something like that yeah, I'm not sure with all the details, but yeah. that work is going to need support, like financial support. True. Um, and, you know, there, there's a specific amount of redress that needs to come with that. But, you know, I want to see that start to show up in the, in the budget. Yeah, no, that's a great ask. And I, I recall Joey asked about getting an economist, like apparently, you know, that's part of the, the Town group like was asking for an economist to help them gauge how much is owed. And uh, at least Ke Kelly said they did have somebody who was about to, to come help them figure all that out. I hope that's true. And again, as we keep saying though, like this stuff can both be true and take two, three, four, five, ten 10 years before somebody actually substantially does anything about it. So I hope that it's not only being started, but that it is like, like you said, like work with urgency. Uh, yeah, yeah I mean, just, this game is being played, man. Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I caution on whether I was going to tell this story or not, but I, I think I kind of want to tell the story. All right, go for it. <laughs> um, but before uh, our past, like, economic developer, economic development uh, director left, there was a, a there was something coming up on the city budget and I didn't know all of this until like after they tried to play me. Right. Um, but it was something coming up with the classic center and a vote. I think it was around the, um, the taxes collected, uh, for the hotel motel tax that the, the government can impose on the classic center. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the county government was trying to raise that and the classic center didn't want it to happen because it would affect their budget, their bottom line. And so, Prior to that vote coming up, and like I said, the only reason I know a lot of this is because in hindsight, I was like, why are they trying to approach me about paying a mural on this new hotel that they about to put attached to the Classic Center? And so it was real weird, right? Like Ryan Moore, Ryan Moore the former economic development director, him and um, what was the other guy's name? I think it was Robert Smalls or something like that. They were in partnership, I guess, on a new hotel that was being built. And they were like, well, we, we would like you to paint a mural on the side of this new hotel. Uh, we'll think it'll be, it'll be great. You know, we'll pay you. Da, 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 da. Put together a budget for us and, and send it to us. And so I'm in there meeting with them and stuff. Um, and then so I send them all the information they asked for. I do a little mock up and everything. Um, and then about a week or two later, I see them at the mayor commission meeting. I'm there for a totally different topic. I, they, wasn't, they weren't even on my radar. But it's like they were trying to position themselves to mitigate any resistance from the people that were making noise about certain things in Athens. Huh. And, I, and, and like I said, in hindsight, it took me a while to kind of put the dots together. But I was like, wow, uh, is, is that like how we, how we doing stuff in Athens? And, you know, Ryan Moore is not here anymore. But after that vote went the way it went, I don't even know if it went in their favor or not. But they didn't even reach back out to me about the mural. <laughs> they went silent about the mural after that. And so there are a lot of things like that that happen behind the scenes in Athens that people don't know about. Mm -hmm. um, of, of people trying to deceive, people trying to, like, manipulate, people trying to do, do certain things. And, and it's and it's all deterring and, and frustrating, um, you know, especially when you're trying to do justice work. Yeah. And like I said, I wasn't even, they weren't even on my radar. I think I was at the mayor commission speaking yeah. to infield housing stuff that night or the anti-discrimination ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were speaking to one of those items. 
or both of those items. And that wasn't even on my radar, like I said. And so just for them to, to try to like position themselves in that way is, is very interesting and very telling. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for telling us three. Yeah. Um, well, I've kept you on here for about an hour. Um, but you know, I want to make sure that you get in, you know, the stuff you wanted to say, um, if there's anything else you wanted to address, or if you want to tell folks about anything, like promote something that that's coming up, if you want to promote the worker center or how people can get involved in certain things. Yeah, there's a lot, man, to promote. And uh, I feel like I'm going to forget something. <laughs> there's yeah. a protest. There's a protest coming up Wednesday beyond Baldwin. Yep. UGA is not off the hook. Um, we're right. still holding UGA accountable for disrupting those uh, people that were enslaved, their remains at Baldwin Hall. Um, there's a lot of exploitation, worker exploitation going on at the university. Um, they're slowly trying to creep their wages up. They're still not at, at an adequate space yet. Um, UGA is one of the largest employers in Athens. UGA, you know, is in constant communication from a political standpoint with our local government on activities and programs. Um, and so UGA needs to be held accountable um, in a lot of ways. Um, so please, if you can, come out to that protest uh, beyond Baldwin, a uh, group of local students, and I think anti Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement are helping to lead that charge. But come out and find out how you can support that work. Uh, it's Wednesday the 12th at 6 p.m. at the Arches, the UGA Arches. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there's like just a lot of other community events coming up. Um, you know, there are some, you know, different job fairs and stuff. I think that EDA, EADC is doing. Um, they have some like, things coming up on their radar. Um, and yeah, the Worker Center through Economic Justice Coalition. You get in mm -hmm. contact with myself or Miss Linda Lloyd to figure out how you can support that work. Um, mm -hmm. I'm excited about a project I got coming up in Bethel Homes. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm partnering with the Housing Authority to uh, bring a temporary art center project to that space. So before they demolish the, the space, uh, I, I have gotten the housing authority to agree to let myself and other artists come in and do murals and hang work, artwork and do installations in some of the uh, apartments as they phase it out in preparation for the redevelopment cycle that's coming. And yeah. so, um, you know, the plan is to hire some of the Bethel residents um, that live in that community and pay them um, actually as cultural workers to help me work on this uh, project. And so, um, you know, in fundraising mode for that and um, hoping to explore some avenues within like the either Rescue Act money or the local government to help get that part of that funded. Um, so that we can do the project and employ some of the residents in Bethel Homes. Um, because I'm trying to set an example of like how you build a budget with equity in mind or with people in mind or with labor in mind. Mm -hmm. And so majority of the budget that I'm building is going to hire people that live in that exact area, in that residence, in that community. Uh, yes, some of them may have gotten stimulus checks, um, but they need other type of supports. And how do we connect them to a pipeline, to a career pathway that they can, you know, easily access while they're in this transition mode of like coming like back to the new Bethel homes? Right. And so these are different things that I'm thinking about um, as, you know, I'm engaging with the housing authority. Like, and what kind of trainings can we hook them up with? Can I get them uh, a couple of workshops about the worker centers to inform them about what their rights are? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different ways in which I want to engage the community in those ways. Um, but that work is upcoming as well. So be on the lookout for that. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, there are several other things <laughs> coming up. Oh, the budget budget inputs uh, sessions. Uh, yeah. Put that I think one is happening tomorrow evening. If That's can, right. Yeah, if you can, and support the work and support equity you know, sign up to speak and, and raise your voice and, and make sure that they bring equity to the budget and include some of the things. If you agree with them, make sure they include some of the things that I spoke to in this last hour or so. Mm -hmm. uh, because like I said, this work, I can't do this work alone. Um, 
and I'm open to suggestions on how to improve the work and how to make the work more sustainable and how to bring like actual tangible items that we can do um, to, to this work with a sense of urgency. With a sense of urgency. Cannot stress that enough. Exactly. Imagine how much we changed our lives over COVID-19 and why are we not acting with a similar kind of urgency just because this thing has been ignored for so long? Right. Um, I'm trying to post the, the links, the mayor and commission meetings about the budget with public input. Um, yep. Thank you, Roderick, for- if you can, I add the link to the people's budget Athens as well. Yeah. We need help. We need help making sure we get that implemented. Right, that right, right now, again, I feel like we st they're stalling on, you know, a, a money raised that idea three years ago. Is it going to take another three years to get participatory budgeting implemented? I right. hope not. I hope not. Right. Yeah. And I, I've heard different things. Like some commissioners feel like SPLOST is like participatory budgeting, which it's definitely not. Nah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> You can you can talk to any one of the the cities the citizen advisory committee members that I've spoken to, and you know it they they are not trashing the process completely, but they identify some areas of weakness. I'd say that, <laughs> and you know it didn't yeah that, that's not participatory budgeting. Right, exactly. I'll get the link to the people's budget on here. And, Especially um, not when you're having like certain groups come back and present after the proposal period has closed. Yeah, that's a real thing. How did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I talked to Paul Kramer and other people with influence, more influence than I, about how that happened. This thing gets a little wonky. All right, sorry that some of my links didn't work, but. Uh, Maybe you guys can copy paste and they'll work a little better. But yeah, there's one there's one meeting tomorrow night, um, and there'll be another one uh, May thirteenth as well, and May twentieth. Um, all where you can give public input and you can give input beforehand. You can also contact the mayor and commission and any any mayor er, the mayor and any commissioner. It's just their first name dot their last name at acc.gov. Um, so, you know, let them know your thoughts. Get involved. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And, and I want to thank, involved. I wanna thank DSA for the, uh, for the opportunity to speak on the platform. Heck yeah. Uh, to raise some of these concerns. Thank you, Roderick. We really appreciate you, you spending uh, your time with us and everything you do. And um, this won't be the last time we talk to you. Yeah, yeah, I hope not. Uh, take care. I hope everybody has a good, good Monday. Reach out to your commissioners. <laughs>